during lockdown 2.0, we've decided for Green Gun to let you meet the local enthusiasts and experts who are kind of keen of getting things done and um, basically feel green. So hopefully you can join us in the series of videos. Uh, and today we are going to welcome uh, Richard. A lot of little with Brittany. And that, uh, I just uh, posted something to the Brittany um, Beach Cleaner website. And uh, we, I found it a pity poor last week, but they found it two weeks earlier on the beaches all along the Brittany coast. And that happens time and time again. Um, yeah. And so I'm very interested in classifying the type of litter we get, and I'm, I'm getting a good handle on it, or where it originates. I'm actually less interested in residential litter because I know we need to push for that. Obviously, in the summer months, a lot of litter is left by visitors and by residents, but I'm particularly interested in shipping litter. We're just south of the merchant shipping lines uh, running up the channel of La Marche. And the, consequently, um, even though it's illegal for ships to drop their litter overboard, yeah, to do dumps, yeah. Yeah. they still do. And then, of course, there's the fishing industry, uh, which is um, both an intentional and an accidental uh, litterer. Um, recreational fishing too uh, produces a lot of litter and also in our part of the world the mollusk and aquaculture industries for oysters and mussels because they're increasingly using plastic in their uh, culture um, equipment uh, that gets lost uh, broken by rough seas and so it breaks up fragments and washes up on our beaches so uh, I think Guernsey is a little unique because we do get so much shipping litter obviously if you're found further away from the shipping lanes. I recorded a thousand ships just coming into the channel over a week. Um, so wow, it's a yeah. huge volume of traffic. Yeah, and it yeah. Comes I think it's, it's one of the busiest in the world, isn't it? People from the Found on the Beach in Guernsey Facebook group run by Sam Rioke. And um, she, she and uh, Janet Unit and uh, Matthew Kneebone and Wayne Brankett, um and Wendy Leprevo and a few others, Barbara uh, Connolly, um, trying to remember, oh, J sorry, Joe Connolly, Barbara Croson, they were all people who shared litter that we used in Carl's photo shoot. I should send you the link to it because um, there is a video uh, that Carl made, an eight and a half minute video, it's on YouTube, but it's also on his own website. Oh yeah, which shows, fabulous, yeah. Yeah, sh basically shows the type of litter that we collected over about a two month period uh, that we brought to his photo studio. Okay, so the first um, video is very short, just 54 seconds, and that's basically a zoom out of the litter that we collected, only a portion of it. Uh, Carl took a whole week, he has five people in his uh, photo studio working for him, and the second one was the shape of a human eye. Uh, he wanted total, um, uh, what should I say, total control, uh, artistic control over the picture. So all I did was supply the litter and he came up with the ideas. And then at the bottom of that page, there is a video which is on YouTube. It's about eight and a half minutes showing the whole process. Oh. Um, it's actually embedded. Um, it so anyway, that's what, that. so that's all Guernsey litter that was collected by found on the beach in Guernsey. Wow. So yeah, that's already speaks volume. Okay, so may I ask you about um, your your commitment to the to the plastic pandemic um, that you have, and what do you come across? So I basically I, um, I was with the NGO, the non government um, organization called Guernsey Climate Action Network (GCAN), mm -hmm. and it, uh, basically there have been a sequence of um, environmental organizations in Guernsey starting. My, my knowledge was Friends of the Earth was here in, in the 70s, and a number of people who still live in Guernsey were uh, responsible for setting that up, including Peter, uh, Deputy Peter Roffey. Uh, uh, GCAN came much later. Um, it was set up, I believe, um, uh, by Simon Bradshaw, Dr. Simon Bradshaw, who now lives in Australia. And it, it lasted about 10 years. And during um, that uh, uh, GCAN uh, sponsor, uh, uh, brought um, message in the waves to a public audience. It was shown at Lake Teals to an audience of about 220 people. And it was during that um, viewing that um, I became interested in plastic litter. I wasn't aware of the extent of it. And that was in 2008. Oh, wow. And so I've been beach cleaning for 12 years um, intensively, but I've now made it a full-time kind of um, non-paid job, volunteer job. So um, I was beach, I, I beach clean about a hundred times a year on average. 
Oh, wow. So in January last last month, I, I did 12 beach cleans. Um, in the summer, I will do fewer because there's less litter. So how does, that, also... um, how does that work? Do you've got, have you got a rotor or are you doing uh, so, same so beaches I, I, every now and then? Well, I, so in 2014, um, Jonathan um, Petty, uh, there was another organization. Um, I'm trying to remember what he's now with soil.gg, tried to um, improve soil structure in Guernsey, working with um, the cider people, uh, Rocket Cider and others. Um, mm -hmm. But um, Jonathan and uh, Mark Wynn um, organized various activities, and, and Jonathan in particular organized a beach clean at Pity Poor. And I was actually beach cleaning. Uh, so it's a long story, but I was with um, the uh, vo emergency volunteer people, I'm trying to, and there was a person who went missing. And I joined a police officer and we walked the entire length of the shore from a ladies bay um, all the way to Bordeaux. And I noticed okay. during that walk, certain parts of the coast were heavily littered. So I determined to go back and pick the litter there. So up until 2014, I was very much concentrating on the North Coast. And yeah. then this, um, there was also a cargo spill of a ship which lost a lot of lumber um, I'm trying oh, yeah. to remember the, I think it was 2013. And I photographed oh, yeah. that and people were going and salvaging the wood, these huge planks of wood at Pity Poor. But yeah, in, 2014, I that, yeah. Yeah, in 2014, I went down uh, with this um, public beach clean and we, there were about 30 volunteers there. And we hauled um, lots of black bin bags to the top of the cliff. And then they were picked up by State Works at a later date time and i photographed the process and it was a big mound of um litter i've got a picture of it if you want me to share it yeah yeah with you yeah um yeah yeah that's it yeah so what's, okay so um, that's chris Morant, the bird watcher there he, he, he very uh, involved in the ornithology section of la societe but this was one beach clean at pity poor and i've been looking at the tides and the currents around guernsey and i realized that pity poor Track, uh, captures a lot of litter. In fact, litter that um, washes up further west will, uh, on a high tide, be dislodged and be carried further east and then end up at Pity Poor. So you might see litter turning up at Plymouth, and a few days later, if there's a high spring tide, it might end up at Pity Poor if it's not picked up before. For mm -hmm. example, um, I found a, um, a fish box in a ravine that was stuck under a um, rock. I'm just going to see if I can... Uh, on, in September, September the 21st, I found a French fish box in a ravine to the west of Pity Paul. Do you see it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and on November the 26th, um, that fish box had been dislodged or torn out from under the boulder. I was not able to remove it when I walked up that ravine. It was so um, firmly attached under this 10-ton boulder that I couldn't shift it other than tearing the plastic. But the sea did it for me. So, you know, this is some evidence that litter travels along the south coast of Guernsey in an easterly direction. And I know from reading a paper in the Journal of the Marine Biological Association that um, water flow is counterclockwise in Guernsey. So right. items that may wash up on the west coast will end up at Pity Poor later. And I have ample evidence of that um, from found on the beach in Guernsey. Um, I've seen litter from ships wash up on the west coast and they will go down to Pity Poor and a few days later it will turn up there. Oh. So, you know, for example, we had some um, cans of Coca-Cola from Israel and they were um, lit of shipping waste because uh, we get ships from Israel passing Guernsey mm -hmm. that have come directly from Israel. And um, anyway, these Coke cans washed up on the west coast and were collected. And then I found a fairly damaged Coke can uh, washing up a Pity Poor a few days later. So it's just lots and lots of evidence to show that litter, we're in a gyra and the litter circulates around Guernsey in a counterclockwise direction. If it is too far south, it will end up in the Big Russell and then go up the channel um, towards yeah. the east and may end up in Eastbourne or Brighton or somewhere like that. Uh -huh. But um, Guernsey is pretty unique from an oceanographic standpoint in um, being able to capture a lot of litter because of this a counterclockwise water flow we yes. have around and the I island. And I guess you've got lots of little crevices and um, and like jagged. Well, 
we it's also have line. the spring tide too so if you need prevailing winds and a big spring tide um, there's a massive volume of water that comes in obviously with a 10 meter tide so that water is carrying a lot of litter with it and then you have the extra force of the wind and anything that's floating on the surface is exposed to that wind and it's called windage and the wind will actually move that litter so it will concentrate that litter into the water that's actually moving in shore yeah, so yeah. if you get that combination, you can get some very big litter dumps on the coast. So when we have more tranquil weather uh, in the summer months, we get less litter because obviously um, yeah. it's not as rough. A lot of litter is actually lying on the sea floor and it takes a turbulence. It takes rough weather to lift it up so, off the sea floor and yeah. move it and bring it to our island. Okay, our I see. So, so what one do you reckon is the volume that we're talking about in there? Um, in, in, in what you're documenting, because you're going about the process in a rather well, I'm going to, dedicated so I've got, way. Yeah, I have, uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm storing litter. I've stored litter now since after Carl Taylor's photo shoot. So when Carl Taylor did that photo shoot in February, I think February the 4th of 2019, all that litter um, was put through the waste management system in Guernsey and then shipped off Ireland. What could be recycled was recycled and the rest was sent to the UK. And then I started collecting litter again. And so um, all my beach cleans, I pretty much, uh, there are a few beach cleans I haven't brought litter back because it's been too big. But a lot of the litter, most of it, 90% of it, 95% perhaps has been brought back home. So my job now is to analyze that litter. Basically, I want to wash it all, um, sort it, and then try and figure out. And that's why I'm working with Helen Quinn and Pierre to try and, um, you know, to, to give them some information. Yeah, and I just wanted to ask, so in the general trends that you've observed with, with those things, what, what do you think are the main um, Well, without a shadow of a doubt, um, commercial fishing litter is overwhelming amount, both from accidental loss and intentional disposal. So one of the most... Um, ubiquitous and most uh, plentiful, uh, most numerous litter items, the short lengths of um, polyethylene twine. It's usually, it's like string, but thick string, and it's used for mending nets. Um, and when a net is torn on the seabed, the fishermen will repair that net, but there'll be lots of cutoffs. And those cutoffs, if you use 10 centimeter mesh, so the cutoffs will be about 10 centimeters. They'll be about the um, length of one of the openings in the net. Uh -huh. And um, they, uh, I sometimes pick up 400 pieces in one beach clean. Um, uh -huh. I would say, obviously, microplastic is far more common, but it's harder to pick up and there's so much of it. Um, but uh, commercial fishing waste includes fish boxes, um, uh, crab pots, lobster pots, all sorts of fishing gear, floats. We also get litter from North America. We will get rope from Nova Scotia and from Canada. We will get parts of stone crab traps from Florida. Oh, we wow. will get octopus pots from Portugal and Spain and even Morocco. Oh, wow. uh, we, we think that some octopus pots, in fact, we know this is the case, they, the octopus pots that are used in West Africa will carry across the Atlantic into the Caribbean, where they often get dumped in the Cayman Islands. And there's a Cayman Islands litter group that I follow, and they show all the West African litter that they find on their shore. But if it doesn't get catch caught by um, those islands then it will come into the north atlantic drift and, and then, it will be and carried come again yeah come and get it will the next come slap. towards us yeah so litter is constantly moving around um, and if we don't pick it out then it will just break down into millions of pieces i'm very concerned that yesterday last night i was photographing some litter that wayne branket had given me from lere and it was a turkish a drink carton uh, like a tetra pack but for, for a sour cherry drink made oh, yeah. in turkey produced in turkey a ship's litter and when I, I put it on a black background to photograph it and all these little plastic pieces came off so it's it's like a waxed or plasticized car carton oh, yeah, I see. and yeah. it was just shedding and i kept having to vacuum the background to get rid of all the little pieces of plastic uh, and fiber that was coming off and i think if this is in the sea all this yes. litter is just shedding these small pieces in their billions and trillions. Yes, and that's yeah. why plastic litter is contaminating every biome on the planet. 
It's yes. been found at the top of Everest. It's found in the Arctic, the Antarctic, mm -hmm. in the most remote places, even in the Mariana Trench on the in the deepest part of the ocean off the Philippines. And so, um, what what do you think um, is the the effect? Have you seen some direct effects on on wildlife in Guernsey? Yeah, I mean, Dave Hubert. Um, he he's probably still living in Guernsey. He did his uh, undergraduate degree dissertation on plastic microfibers in Guernsey beaches. And he had a photograph of a mussel. Uh, and in that, in, in the blood, in the vessels, in the mussel were plastic microfibers. So filter feeding animals like oysters and mussels and scallops are picking up plastic and it's entering their bodies. Now, we don't really know what impact it has, but we do know that a lot of this plastic um, is hydrophobic and it basically it repels water, but it attracts chemicals such as DDT, uh, PCB, polychlorinated biphenols. So we, uh, some of these chemicals are highly, uh, you know, cause cancer, cause mm -hmm. uh, ecotoxins. So we feel that plastic is a vehicle for ecotoxins that are spread in the environment. So the microplastic uh, enters the uh, bodies of all these marine creatures, as well as our bodies if we eat them. Um, and there's a growing body of work, a, a, a lot of research is focused on, on the impact of this and, and how it may lead to disease. Obviously, yeah. um, I've seen photographs of um, large pieces of plastic um, causing um, intestinal blockage. Um, a minke whale washed up on the Normandy coast some years ago, and they pulled out a whole lot of shopping bags from its stomach. And yeah. it, it was yeah. a juvenile minky whale, and it was thought to have died from intestinal blockage. The same thing happens to turtles who mistake a plastic bag for a jellyfish. Oh, yeah. uh, and also seabirds get caught up in balloons, uh, caught up in string. Uh, sometimes seals will have uh, plastic rings around their necks, which can cause a lot of tissue damage. Yeah. There are hundreds of species that have been directly impacted by plastic litter, uh, and they usually end up causing fatality. Yes, that's, that's true. And so what do you think that, you know, the, the public thinks? Because I think when when people, for example, they go to Petitport and it's always, well, there's always a bit of debris, but then the beach is cleaned on a regular basis. Do you think that it cannot hide the problem from, from the public in some ways? And what could we do to make people more aware about? Well, if you see the picture I shared with you with Chris Morant in it, that would be pity poor without any beach cleaning. I don't know how long a period that was, but that was the litter that was picked up off the beach on one day. Oh, wow. One okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you if you stop litter picking, the beach will soon fill up. Now, I, I'd be, you know, I'm sure Pierre and others go down to pity poor. I just got back today and I picked up another bin bag, but I went into the ravines. I found ten plastic bottles. I found a very long piece of rope. Um, I, I had quite a heavy bag today and I've done every other day. I do it for my health um, as part of my exercise routine to go down to Pichipur and a little pick. I don't do it every day, but I look at the tides and the wind and I decide which day would be good. Yeah, and um, yes. also polystyrene. We need legislative action. We, we need to stop the use of polystyrene in the ocean because it is fragmenting into so many pieces and it's entering the chemicals and the um, toxins adhering to it are entering the food chain and entering marine life. So, and it's important, once it's in the system, it's really hard to get out because it just gets broken down into smaller and yeah. smaller pieces. And early, early on to today, you were talking about the um, um, uh, aquaculture um, residue and also uh, the recreational fishing yeah. Why, why is the kind of things that you find in that regard? Well, you know, there's a, a good little uh, meme somewhere on uh, on the internet. It's like, well, you know, one I, I, one straw um, for eight billion people, and and the idea is that one straw isn't the problem, but when eight billion people use a straw, it becomes a big problem. And it's yeah. the same with the recreational fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, someone may accidentally lose a packet that they open a packet. They're on the shore. It's windy, it's cold, it's wet, their fingers are not working 
perfectly. They tear a packet open to pu pull out some plastic bead or a float or a weight or a hook, and then they lose the packet or they lose the bead. And so when you look at recreational fishing litter, there's just so much of it because there's so many people fishing. It may not be one individual who's you know causing the litter, but it's just the repeated occurrence of litter episodes, litter accidents, where people are in a hostile environment trying to catch a fish, it's dark, they've got a headlight, and they accidentally lose a packet or they lose a plastic bead. Yeah. And then you lose fishing gear. Um, and so there's an increasing number of plastic um, items that recreational fishermen lose, including, of course, fishing lures, which are very expensive. Yes. yes. Now, with um, molluscan aquaculture, the French farmers to allow to attract oysters to settle on their structures to grow oysters. They used to use clay tiles, roof tiles, the red ones, and they used to cover them in lime so that the oysters would be attracted to the tiles. But they decided that it was more efficient because the tiles broke and they were heavy and they were expensive to use plastic discs. And you, if you Google oyster spat collectors or do it in French, you will see at Cancal, in Pampol, and other places, they have these huge fields full of plastic discs, oh, and yeah, these yeah, things yeah. break off. Now, I sometimes will see a whole section of plastic discs. I may ha I've had 13 in one go, and I had nine the other day. But more often than not, an individual disc will break up. And if it gets onto Guernsey shore with rough weather, it will break up into a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. So I not only have the whole um, type of set up with the pole with all the discs on them but I also have the microplastic from these plastic discs and they're very identifiable because they're ridged to in, uh, produce a high surface area oh, yeah, so yeah. when you have a maritime industry using plastic in its operations that causes a problem because yeah. you introduce and it gets broken you know, up in storms you're going to get and... losses yeah it's not intentional loss it's accidental it's due to storm damage so the mussels, the mul, they're, they're grown on a bouchot, I think it's called, uh, these stakes, these poles. And yes, they yeah. wrap the mussels in bags, in plastic bags. And they wrap the, it's a plastic mesh, and they wrap the mesh around the pole. Now, of course, with storms again, the plastic is going to get damaged. So you get all these plastic nets washing off the mussels. And yeah, it, yeah. you just can go, you know, there's so many, the ta Tahitian skirts. So um, to stop crabs climbing the poles, they use plastic sheet at the bottom of the pole, which makes it harder for the, the crab can't purchase, can't grab onto the uh, side of the pole to climb up to eat the mussels. So they slide off. But these plastic sheets, which are cut at the bottom, that's why they're called a Tahitian skirt, they fall off and uh, we get them with great frequency well. washing up on goods. Yeah. Okay, so so what do you, um, what would you encourage people to do on the, uh, on a daily well, basis or using the like you your two hours of uh free uh, walking well, around during do, lockdown <laughs> we we have to build up data sets which i think helen and pierre will do we have to analyze what litter were and then we have to go out and encourage these various industries to change their practices so that this litter because it is becoming overwhelming problem this is something that's happened in the last 50 years, but it's accelerating. Yeah. Have you uh, noticed the difference since you've started in 2008? Uh, well, to be honest with you, it's just as bad now. It, it, it's no better. You know, the amount of litter I'm picking off the beach is just as much. I'm better at litter picking now. I know where to look. I know <laughs> where the litter accumulates. Before, I was quite timid. I just stay on the beach. But now I go into the ravines. I look between rocks. You know, I, I look everywhere. So I, I just find the more I look, the more I find. And I know that every time I leave a beach, I leave a lot of litter on the beach. Um, so so in terms of your categorization, that what you're, you're, all your, what you're recovering and, and keeping to make that record, yeah. how, do you, how do you sort that out? Do you re record a country of origins or type or size? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm encouraging people to save shipping litter for me because we have, you know, I want eventually to get a remotely operated vehicle to go along the seabed. I, um, there was a, a podcast, um, there was a webinar I attended uh, for Mediterranean litter. And in the Mediterranean, um, one of the research universities had sent a remotely operated vehicle to the seabed 2,000 meters down. 
and the whole seabed was covered in plastic. I mean, it was just, it was like a landfill down there in the middle of the ocean. And I believe that because we only see a small amount of plastic actually washing up on our shore, that if we sent a ROV under the shipping lane, particularly at the approach to La Marche or the, the, the English Channel, around the Brittany coast, under there, we'd find a similar situation, but it needs to be proved. We only yeah. see a small selection of the litter that these ships drop. It's illegal to drop it overboard, but we need the evidence to prove just how much they're dropping overboard. And it's, from cert it's not every ship. A lot of shipping lines have very good policies for retaining their litter and disposing of it in the port. And Seas at Risk, another NGO, worked very hard with the European Commission to try and encourage all shipping lines to take their litter to port where it'd be safely disposed. But there are a few independents and there are a few ship crews that obviously they get guidance from the captain where it's almost policy to throw bin bags over the, overboard before they get into port because obviously all the litter they have to uh, drop off to at the for. harbor cost them money. So yeah, they're yeah, saving yeah. money, it's externalizing the cost. Yeah, yeah, and it costs a great cost to the nature, I suppose. It, yeah, so what we need to do is work diligently to record the information, photograph everything you collect so it can be analyzed, we know where it comes from. I'm not saying photograph every item, but photograph every litter, you know, just the group of the, the thing, because people can see from the photograph what there is in there. If it's plastic bottles, the labels, things like that. I mean, for people who have the time to do it, I mean, it shouldn't be that time consuming with a mobile phone. Use the existing social media groups such as found on the beach in Guernsey because they're very useful for sharing information. And obviously Clean Earth Trust has its own group and, and others. And um, then we can actually give the evidence, write papers, um, let, approach the politicians, both locally and internationally, to just show the scale of the problem so that something can actually be done. If more people actually approach politicians about the severity of this problem, I think action will be taken. The problem is that it's very intermittent at the moment. If one researcher writes a letter to the International Maritime Organization says we have a real problem with plastic bottles, they don't take notice. But if people from all over the world start writing to them, they'll start to do something about it. Yeah, again, there's yeah, probably a number, the more, the more people do that, then the more we pressure they will feel. Pressure. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Uh, okay, is there, was there anything else that uh, you wanted to, uh, to conclude uh, with today? Well, I, you know, obviously, um, Clean Earth Trust has initiated this new Take 3 for Guernsey. And yeah. I would just encourage anyone who does that, and it's worthwhile doing, just to record um, with the mobile phone what they've collected so that others can put that in a database so we know actually what's showing up because um, and also I have to warn people that sometimes munitions or toxic substances wash up but it's very important to be aware that some litter items washing up are dangerous and should be reported to the um, necessary authorities in Guernsey for a safe removal from the shore. Okay well thank you so much for for your time it's been uh, very My nice pleasure. to have a chat with you. About okay, this. nice to meet you over Zoom. Yes, 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 lockdown, lockdown oblige. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll be back in uh, talking uh, about plastic again. Well, thank you so thank much you for very this. Much. Okay. okay, bye, Take Richard. Care. Bye, bye, bye.